Well, we've got a short series on Job. We're calling it The Perfect Storm. We come to message number four. And if you remember, Job has lost everything, even his children. There's nothing left. And so the inevitable question is, why? Why has this happened to Job? And Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, know the answer. Each is confident he can explain Job's suffering. Each is confident he can explain how God rules the world. So we'll call this morning's message, How Wrong Can You Be? And in Job, from chapter 4 to chapter 28, we have three rounds of heated arguments. So Eliphaz speaks, Job replies. Bildad speaks, Job replies. Zophar speaks, Job replies. That's just round one. And then we go through it all again in round two. And then there's a round three. And by the third round, Job and his three friends have moved further and further apart, and there is no middle ground. So this morning we just have two points. And point number one we'll call Job's friends. Okay, Job is suffering. Why is he suffering? Well, say Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, uh, listen to us. We can explain why you're going through all this Job. And each appeals to a different sort of authority. So chapter 4, Eliphaz speaks of a mystical experience. And chapter 8, Bildad points to tradition, the sort of hoarded wisdom of the past. And so for chapter 20, he believes in observable facts. But whether it's mysticism, tradition, or the scientific method, each is sure that he can explain why Job is suffering as he is. So what's their argument? Well, it's simply this. Job, God is in control, and God is just. So he punishes the wicked, and he rewards the righteous. So Job, if you suffer more than others, it can mean only one thing, that you are a greater sinner than others. But of course, they're wrong. Job is suffering not because he's guilty, he's suffering because he's innocent. Says who? Says God. Remember? Chapter 2, verse 3, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. God himself says this is innocent suffering. Job is suffering to prove that the devil is a liar, that there is such a thing as childlike trust and loving obedience, that he doesn't obey God because God rewards him, because God pays the best wages. He obeys God because God is the light of his life. So Job resists the charges, the false charges of his three friends. He's convinced that this is innocent suffering. And if you read what Job says, he says essentially this. He says, yes, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, I am a sinner but not in a way that explains this, not in a way that explains why I have been singled out. And anyway, he goes on, for example, in chapter 21, he says, when I look around me, it seems that the wicked do get away with it in this world. So his three friends say, Job, you're guilty. He says, Job, no, I'm not. I'm not guilty. Well, that's just a very brief overview. Let's, let's, let's sample some of these speeches. So we're going we're to move through them. So if you have the, in, uh, your Bible in front of you, we're going to look at little samples of various speeches. Don't worry if you, you can just listen to as we read things out. So let's look at these speeches of Job's friends. Now, last week we looked at Eliphaz's first speech, and it's the kindest of all the speeches. And Eliphaz has got it all worked out. He says in chapter 5, verse 27, he said, Behold, we have searched this out. It is true. Hear it, and know for yourself. And he says, essentially, this is Job. He says, Job, you're a good man, and God doesn't condemn good men. But even Job, good men are sinners, and so God disciplines them for their own good. So Job, seek the Lord, and after this time of chastening, all will be well. Well, maybe if at that point Job had said, thank you, my friend. 
I now see, oh yes, you're right, you're right, you're right. I now see five, chapter 5, verse 17, behold, happy is the man whom the law, whom God corrects. Maybe if Job would agree with Eliphaz, it all would have stopped there. But of course, Job bats it back hard. Chapter 6, verse 4, he says, For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. He said, God is not correcting me as a friend. God is killing me as an enemy. Oh, thanks very much, Eliphaz. In fact, thanks all of you. Chapter 6, verse 14, To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend. You're not showing me any kindness, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brooks that pass away. I thought you'd come to help me. I thought you'd come to revive me. But you're like deceitful brooks. When you look to them to give you refreshment and help, they're not there. And so Job go, goes on for another chapter and a half. It, you, you, it's, it's wonderful words, wonderful poetry. It's gripping. Read it. Well, chapter 8, Bildad is listening to all this. Now it's his turn to speak. And so he says, chapter 8, verse 2, How long will you speak these things, and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? Does God subvert judgment, or does the Almighty pervert justice? Job, you windbag. Are you seriously suggesting that God is unjust in the way he's dealing with you? Verse 4, if your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. This is a friend talking to him. He says, if your children died, it was because they were great sinners. Ouch. But God hasn't killed you, Job. So maybe there's hope for you. And if you repent, Job, all will be well. Chapter 8, verse 21, he will yet fill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. He just told him that God has killed his children because they were great sinners, but ah, you repent, Job, and you'll be laughing. And of course, again, Job bats it back. This is innocent suffering. So now in wade Zophar, chapter 11, and verse 2. Should not the multitude of words be answered, and should a man full of talk be vindicated? Should your empty talk make men hold their peace? And when you mock, should no one rebuke you? Job, I'm not going to put up with you talking like that. I'm not going to sit in silence and, and listen to you. Verse 4, for you have said, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in your eyes. I'm an innocent man, but oh, that God would speak and open his lips against you, that he would show you the secrets of wisdom, for they would double your prudence. Know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. Oh, Job, you are a great sinner, but you're not getting half of what you deserve. God is not unjust. It's just, Job, that you're too stupid to see it. Look at verse 12 of chapter 11. For an empty-headed man will be wise when a wild donkey's colt is born a man. A fool can no more be wise, Job, than a wild donkey's colt can be born to a man. These are his friends. Getting more aggressive, isn't it? More hostile. You can feel the, the temperature is rising. So what's Zophar's remedy? Well, of course, if all this has come upon Job, because Job is a great sinner, and God is actually being merciful with him, dealing with him like that. He's not getting half of what he deserves. What's the answer? Repent, Job, repent. If you would, verse 13, if you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hands toward him, if iniquity were in your hand and you put it far away, I would not let wickedness dwell in your tents, then surely you could lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and not fear. But again, Job bats it back. Yes, I'm a sinner, but not in a way that explains this. Not in a way that explains why God has singled me out. 
And he says in chapter 12, verse 2, he says, no doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. Oh, you're the people. You, know, you have all the answers. You're the people and you're so wise. And when you die, there'll be no more wisdom in this world. Verse 3, but I have understanding as well as you. And I'm not inferior to you. Indeed, who does not know such things as these? I know what you're telling me. I've heard it all before. Don't you think I, I've got a brain as well? Don't you think I've worked it out? And by chapter 13, Job says, I'm, I'm through talking with you, Lot. Verse 13, chapter 13, Behold, my eye has seen all this, my ear has heard and understood. What you know, I also know. I'm not inferior to you. Oh, but I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. I'm getting nowhere with you, Lot. I need to speak to God. Well, chapter 15, back comes Eliphaz. And if his first speech was the kindest, Eliphaz now puts the boot in. First time round, Job, I gave you the benefit of the doubt. I tried to reason with you. But there's no reasoning with you, Job. You're just a wicked sinner living in denial. Chapter 15, verse 6, your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. Verse 14, what is man that he could be pure? And he who is born of a woman, that he could be righteous. If God puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water. Oh, Job, don't start saying you're innocent. How can you say that? You're abominable. You're, you're filthy. Job, the wicked get their comeuppance. So if you carry on like this, only going to go one way. But if you read Eliphaz's speech, it's interesting, there's no grappling with the issues. Job's raised serious issues. Each time he bats it back, he says, that's not true. But there's no, there's no grappling with the issues that Job has raised. And there's no humility. Certainly there's no sympathy. And if these are his friends, there doesn't appear to be much love on show. Eliphaz just asserts things. He says, Job, this is the way that things are. This is the way that God works. I know what I'm talking about, Job. Well, so it goes on. Chapter 18, Bildad wades in again. How, verse 2, how long till you put an end to words? You're just an old windbag, Job. You're going on and on and on. Gain understanding. Listen to what we're saying. Think about it. Meditate on it. And afterward we will speak. Why are we counted as beasts and regarded as stupid in your sight? Do you think we, we, we're brainless, dumb animals? But by now it's clear that Job's friends have stopped listening. Chapter 18, verse 4, they say, well, uh, Bildad says, You who tear yourself in anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you, or shall the rock be removed from its place? Shall we turn the universe on its head, Job, just to prove that you're right? Hmm? Job the great innocent and God unjust? Is that the way the universe works? Do you want us to do that? Turn the world on its head? You're innocent. God is unjust. Shall we rearrange the moral fabric of the universe? Move this immovable rock over here just to prove that you're innocent? Come on. But again, we, we read, didn't we, chapter 18? But did you notice Bildad's speech? There's no argument, is there? There's no reasoning. There are no examples to back up what he's saying. There's no evidence to support his case. There's no application. Basically, he says to Job, shut up. Do you think we're stupid? Will you turn everything on its head just to justify yourself? Don't you get it, Job? God punishes the wicked. And if you've lost everything, do the arithmetic. 
It's because you're wicked. And by this stage, it's almost pantomime. We've got Job over here saying, this is innocent suffering. And his friends say, oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. And they're getting louder and louder. Oh, no, it's not. Well, chapter 20, Zophar wades in again. And by now, it's just a blazing row. He says this. He says, oh, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 2. Therefore, my anxious thoughts make me answer because of the turmoil within me. Oh, I'm so upset by what you're saying, Job. I've heard the rebuke that reproaches me and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. Job, I'm so upset. How dare you talk to me like that? you think they're the ones who are suffering, wouldn't you? And then he goes on this whole thing again. Verse 4, don't you know? And there they go again. And what does he say? He says the same old thing. There's no escape for the wicked. In this world, God punishes bad people. And if you're suffering, Job, it's because you're a bad person. And he really warms to his themes, Zophar. If you just look at chapter 20, verse 23, he's talking about what happens to the wicked. When he is about to fill his stomach, God will cast on him the fury of his wrath, and he will rain on him while he is eating. He will flee from the iron weapon. A bronze bow will pierce through. It is drawn and comes out of his body. Yes, the glittering point comes out of his gall. Terrors are up come upon him. Total darkness is reserved for his treasures. An unfanned fire will consume him. It shall go ill with him who is left in his tent. The heavens will reveal his iniquity and the earth will rise up against him. The increase of his house will depart and his goods will flow away in the day of his wrath. This is the portion from God for a wicked man, the heritage appointed to him by God. It's just loud, isn't it? It's just heated. It's dogmatic. Job, you just need to be told. And again, Job tries to reason with them. And by the time we come to Eliphaz's third speech, chapter 22, his tone is sneering. Chapter 22, verse 4, is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? Or is it because you're so holy, Job, that God is dealing with you like this? And if he's sneering, he's just plain nasty. Verse 5, is not your wickedness great? and your iniquity without end. Job, you are a wicked man. Your iniquity is without end. And because there's no evidence to back up what he says, Eliphaz, to justify what he says, starts to point to, to secret sins or things that Job is supposed not to have done. So chapter 22, uh, verse 6, he says, "'For you have taken pledges from your brother, for no reason, and stripped the naked of their clothing. He's got no evidence for that. You have not given the weary water to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. It's not, there's no evidence for that. It's not true. The elephant just got nasty. He's determined to pin something on Job. So in the absence of any obvious sins that he can see, he starts thinking, well, there must be things that Job hasn't done. You can always nail someone for something they haven't done, can't you? Because it's the lack of evidence that's the evidence of their guilt, isn't it? If you start nailing people for sins they haven't done, <laughs> oh, sorry, things they haven't done, well, it's the, the fact there is no evidence is the evidence, yes? Have you ever done that? Take an offense at someone? And because you haven't got anything on them, you start thinking, oh, yeah, some secret sin, some hidden motive, something they were supposed to have said, something actually they, they didn't do, which they should have done. Because it's something that, if it's something they didn't do, you don't need any evidence for that, do you? A motive you're sure they have because you can't see motives. So your lack of evidence becomes the evidence. Well, that's what Eliphaz is doing to Job. So often we can do it to our brothers and sisters. A Christian friend, it's the devil's work, isn't it? He's the accuser. He's the one who finds fault when there is no fault. So let's not do the accuser's work for him. Job's 
friend. You can read, a, read it other times. No wonder Job says in chapter 16, verse 2, he says, uh, miserable comforters are you all. I mean, who needs friends? These, these are his friends. Who needs friends like you? So by the end, Job's friends have stopped listening. They haven't answered any of Job's points. And the more he resists, the more he asserts that this is innocent suffering, the more they see a hardened sinner. The fact you're not listening to us, Job, must mean you're a hardened sinner and you just need to be told. And they become increasingly hostile, aggressive, suspicious. They start pointing the finger. They're accusing him of things without any evidence at all. It gets more and more heated. And in the end, without a shred of evidence, they say, Job, you are a wicked, wicked, wicked man. How wrong can you be? So point number two, what are the lessons for us? Now, Christian friends, this might be uncomfortable. Why? Well, and if as Bildad and Zophar, they worship the true God. They're believers. They believe that God is holy and wise and just and sovereign. They believe he's rich in mercy. That's why they make these appeals to Job to repent. They believe that he's the God of wonders. Eliphaz's first speech. Speaking of God, he says he does great things, unsearchable, marvelous things without number. What's more, these men have a zeal for God and for his glory. As they see it in the, in the face of Job's refusal to acknowledge his sin, as they see it, God must be vindicated. The more Job resists, the more they feel they, they have to vindicate God. When they're, when they're speaking, they feel they're standing up for God. They're jealous for his glory, even at the cost of their friendship with Job. And these men love holiness. They love holy living, holy words. As Eliphaz says, the counsel of the wicked is far from me. And they're earnest and they're tender in their appeals to sinners to repent. Chapter 22, it says, Receive, please, instruction from, from his mouth, from God's mouth, and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. You will remove iniquity far from your tent. Then you will lay your gold in the dust, and the gold off here among the stones of the brooks. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. Tender words they're using, pleading with Job to repent. So they're tender in their appeals to a sinner as they see it. And they're thoroughly orthodox. Chapter 22, verse 16, they believe in the flood. And when you listen to their speeches, you would say that these are Bible men. And they preach some great gospel sermons. In so many ways, they're theologically correct. And yet, for all that, they are so wrong. And Christian friends, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because we worship God. And we're zealous for His glory. We stand up for God. We too love holiness. We too long for sinners to repent. We too are theologically correct, and yet for all that, we can get it wrong, so wrong. So where do they go wrong? Number one, they're wrong about Job, aren't they? Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar say, Job suffers because he's a sinner. But of course, the opposite is true. Job is suffering because he's innocent. He's suffering to prove that the devil is a liar. He's suffering to prove that in this world there is such a thing as childlike trust and willing obedience. That he fears God not because God blesses him. He fears God because God is worthy of his worship. That's why he does it. So Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, they say many things which are true and biblical and right. But all those true things are built on a falsehood. 
that Job is guilty. So, Christian friends, we can say all the right things and be totally wrong. We can use God's truth to advance a lie. We can use all the right verses, it's all true, but actually the premise is completely false. And who's working on this premise that obedience equals blessing? Well, it's Satan, isn't it? That's that's, that's his argument. Does Job fear God for nothing? So not only are our three friends wrong about Job, but they're unwittingly advancing Satan's premise. And they're unwittingly doing his work by tearing to shreds a holy, godly, innocent man. How wrong can you be? And number two, they're wrong about suffering. In their minds, all their equations have got to balance in this world. It's all going to be sorted out now, which means that a just God must punish the wicked in this world, and a just God must reward the righteous in this world. Which means if you suffer more than others, it must be because you're a bigger sinner than others. But that's not true. They have no theology of godly suffering. What would they make of the cross? Where he who never sinned received the wages of sin. Where the one true, perfect, innocent in the universe became the greatest sufferer. They would have no room for the cross. Because in seeing Jesus suffer, they say it's because he's a greater sinner than everyone else. That's the way their equation works. Now, Christian friend, do you believe the godly godly should suffer? You're you're clear about the cross. Jesus, Jesus was innocent, but he was dying for my sins. But what about the godly suffering. You know, surely Christians can expect happy marriages. Surely they can expect obedient children who will all believe. And good health. And surely, as Christians, we can expect wonderful churches where we can serve the Lord full on without any difficulties, heartaches, discouragements, frustrations, problems. You know, if there are problems in a church, well, It must be somebody's fault. Someone's not walking with the Lord. There must be some sin somewhere that's causing all of this. And then after a full, healthy, fruitful, active life, we say, I'm going to die a wonderful, comfortable death in Jesus. And when it doesn't work out, we're shocked. And we think, what's gone wrong? What have I done wrong? What have they done wrong? And Christian friends, that's that sound of music theology. You know, some of you are better acquainted with the sound of music than I am, but you know, Maria and the captain, they fall in love. And she sings, and then he joins in, they duet together. What does she sing? She says, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. Yeah? What's she singing? She's saying, something good is happening to me. So I must have done something good. Because good things happen to good people. The other side of that means that bad things must happen to bad people. (coughs) And actually, we have that theology very often, don't we? I mean, we wouldn't say it, but actually that's nursing quite deep in our hearts. Because when things go wrong, what do you do? You start thinking, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? And like Job's friends, it's because we have no theology, no underpinning that in this world, actually, the innocent, the godly, will suffer. And actually, in this world, frequently, the innocent, the godly, suffer more than the ungodly. 
And the third thing is they, they, they're wrong about God. They're wrong about Job, they're wrong about suffering, and they're wrong about God. They misrepresent God. Because right at the end of the book, this is what God says. He says this to Eliphaz. So it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that, he, that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. It says, God, I'm angry with you, Eliphaz, and your two friends, because you've misrepresented me. When you've spoken and said, in God's name it's like this, well, don't use my name. You're wrong about me. But don't they say wonderful things about God? Yes, they do. But as you follow the arguments, you realize that Job is much further along than his friends. He really is coming to terms with the greatness of God. He's coming to terms with a God who really is sovereign and incomprehensible. He's beginning to understand that only God can explain God. Only God understands God. Job's God is not a tame God. But when you look at his three friends, their God is tame. Their God is small. Their God, you can put him in a box. Their God fits all the equations. Job worships the God he cannot understand, that he cannot explain. They worship a God they can explain, which is why they misrepresent God and have no idea just how great God really is. Very challenging, isn't it? You can know your Bible. You can say God is wonderful. There's no one like him. You can think that you have the answers, and yet you can still get it utterly wrong about God. And the greater is the damage that you can do because you've got a Bible in your hand. If you have the Beano in your hand, no one will take you seriously. But I've got a Bible in my hand and I quote verses, the greater the damage I can do. And we can just see, simply be godly fools. How wrong can you be? And finally, number four. They're wrong about themselves. Job, we know. We find it a lot in what they say. We know, we know, we know. But they don't know, do they? They teach when they should be silent. And the more Job challenges their assertions, the angrier they get. And they don't address his arguments. They just raise their voices. They just think, Job needs to be told. And the louder I said, as it were, the more backbone it puts in my argument. And there's all this venom and nastiness and accusations. Towards who? Towards the one man in all the world who is blameless. He's the godliest man in the world. And yet they're accusing him of all of these things. I wonder at the end of it they have to repent. Now, Christian friends, when you think about that, I, I find all this very uncomfortable when I start working through the implications of all of this. Bildad's speech, chapter 18, verse 4. He says this, Shall the earth be forsaken for you, or shall the rock be removed from its place? Okay, it's, it's all poetry, it's beautiful poetry. What's he saying? He's saying, Job, to prove you're right, shall we turn the universe on its head? To fit in with your contention that you are innocent, do we have to move the unmovable? That's what they're saying. But you see, when Job asserts that this is innocent suffering, it's not God's universe that's being turned on its head, is it? The only universe being turned on its head is their universe. These immovable rocks on which they built their position are only immovable because they refuse to see any other viewpoint. They refuse 
to have their mindset, their theology, their understanding challenged. Now, Christian friend, is that you? Is that me? You're so sure, so certain, so fixed. You're so right. Which is why you always feel you've got to have the last word. Job's experience fitted their equation. They see a man suffering, and in their equation that must mean he's therefore a sinner. But they never ever questioned whether their equation was right. That's the way they saw the world. They were all agreed that's the way the world was, but it never crossed their mind to question whether what they said was true. Christian friend, is that you? What happens when fellow Christians challenge your beliefs and convictions? What happens when fellow Christians start moving rocks upon which you've built your position? Do you immediately assume that if they move that rock, that they're wrong and you're right? Do you go on to the attack? Because as far as you're concerned, you're standing up for God. You're standing up for the truth. And if they don't back down, do you get angry? Maybe you start finding fault. Maybe you start looking at them and thinking, aha, there must be some hidden agenda, some sinful motive. Do you actually try to understand what they're saying? Or do you simply restate your position with ever greater emphasis? Are you a them and us Christian? So that when someone moves the rock upon which you built your position, immediately you're over here and they must be over there because you have no desire to really understand. And of course, if it's a them and us with other Christians, it can become a me and the church. When was the last time you changed your mind on one of these rocks that shouldn't be removed from its place. Some Christians said, I don't think that's true, I think it's like this. When was the last time you said, you know, actually, that's right. I see it now. When was the last time you changed your mind? And when was the last time, in Paul's words, you submitted to your brothers and sisters in the fear of God? You didn't feel, I have to get my own way. I said, well, if that's what the church is, and that's what the church wants to do, and I'm part of this church, they're my brothers and sisters, I will submit myself to my brothers and sisters. That's why I said this is very uncomfortable stuff. You see, because when we think sometimes we're standing up for God... Sometimes all we're doing is just simply standing up for ourselves. When we feel we've nailed our colors to God's truth, actually what it can sometimes simply be is a stubborn heart and an unwillingness to yield. And I want things my way. And we can turn our preferences into, into principles, immovable principles. You see, our greatest sins hide in the holiest of places. Because it's the last place we'd look. Our greatest sins can be when we feel we're standing up for God and defending His truth and doing what's right. Because, of course, that must be a holy thing to do. It's the last place I'd expect there to be a stubborn heart. Who would have thought with Job's three friends, that their, their tender appeal to Job to repent. But actually, underneath it was simply the sin of pride and self-righteousness. That the strength of their appeal is actually because they want to be proved right in the end. They were wrong about themselves, weren't they? Christian friend, maybe it's time to ask the Lord if you have been wrong about yourself. 
That's for many years. You've been immovable on many things. But are those things Bible things? Many years ago, a brother came to see me. He's no longer here. I don't, I don't make it quite like that. He's no longer it was, it was a good, good and legitimate reason he was not, he'd moved away. Um, a brother came to see me about a sermon I preached <coughs> nearly 20 years ago, so that's, that's a long time ago. And he disagreed with my exposition, and he disagreed with my application. And the more we discussed that disagreement, the angrier he became. I said, I said okay, we disagree, but, but why are you so angry? And what he did next made me want to hug him. Because this is what he said. He said to me, he said, you're right. You're right. Why am I so angry? Why am I so angry about this sermon that was preached? Why? He said, forget about the sermon. The sermon is not the issue. That's not the important thing. The real issue is why am I so angry? And Christian friends, so often the real issue is that we want to have the last word. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we think of Job's three friends, and we can stand apart at the things that they said and say, is that terrible the way they're speaking to Job? And yet, Lord, so often we find their shoes quite comfortable to stand in. And, Lord, we find ourselves... We find ourselves raising our voices. We find ourselves becoming assertive. We find ourselves becoming angry. Lord God, we pray that you would shine a light into our hearts. Search us, O oh God, search us. Cast the, uh, the searchlight, that laser beam, into those dark places, those places which have become calloused, those places which, have been, which we've left undisturbed for many years, and change us changes that we might be like Christ. We thank you that he wasn't someone who raised his voice in the streets. He wasn't a bully. He wasn't assertive. We thank you that a bruised reed and a smoking flax he didn't break, and a smoking flax he didn't quench. We thank you that he loved the people who were before him. We pray, our God, grant us more of the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, and grant us all, Lord, this day, repentance. We thank you, Lord, repentance is simply coming back to you. And in that path is light and joy and, and all that we need. So, Father, help us to work these things through in our own lives and in the life of the church. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.